Apple Card is the perfect cashback rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. Hey there, Culture Gab Fest listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI. And stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest John Stewart Returns Edition. It's Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. On today's show, to do justice to the absurdity and, frankly, cruelties of the 2024 election, John Stewart has returned to host The Daily Show only once a week, I should say, every Monday night. Nevertheless, there's been a spike in ratings and controversies uh, we will discuss. And then Problemista is the first feature film from comedian Julio Torres. It stars Torres as an aspiring toy designer and Tilda Swinton as the art world big P personality who takes him under her wing, sort of. And finally, very, very good friend, old friend of the program, Dan Pashman of the Sporkful Podcast is here to discuss how, with no prior experience, he created a cookbook called Anything's Possible. Joining me today is Dan Kois, author of the novel Vintage Contemporaries, and uh, of course, all around slate guy. Dan, welcome back. Thanks. Glad to be here. And of course, Dana Stevens is the film critic of Slate. Hey, Dana. Hey, hey, Steve. Uh, we ready to make a show? Mm, let's go. All right, let's go. All right, well, The Daily Show was a relatively indifferent creative property on Comedy Central. It was not especially popular or really original. It was an extended weekend update, effectively. When John Stewart took it over, took over the hosting duties in 1999, what turned out to be a series of curses for the rest of us, the Bush-Gore debacle, and then, of course, the presidency of George W. Bush, was comedy gold for Stewart. All right, well, here is John Stewart taking on Katie Britt's response to the State of the Union. Let's listen. Would it survive a concise and intelligent rebuttal from the GOP? <laughs> or whatever it was that Alabama Senator Katie Britt... <laughs> Our country can do better. Mr. President, enough is enough. End this crisis and stop the suffering. We see you and we stand with you. If you're going to stand with me, (laughs) could you stand a little bit further away? (laughs) I imagine one of her kids just came downstairs and was like, I'm sorry, mom, I just came down to get a bowl of cereal. I didn't realize you were losing your f-ing mind. <laughs> I'll come back when the zannies kick in. All right, Dan. Well, it's a good sign that uh, in the clip and coming out of the clip, I was laughing. I think we were all laughing. What do you make of John Stewart's return to The Daily Show? I will say that watching him in his first return episode, there was something a little alarming about watching the guy attempt to host this show with that same youthful twinkle even though his actual youthful twinkle has has long departed. He made real hay out of that on his first show back. He had a good series of bits about that, but it is still a little bit of a shock to see him, you know, mugging and making faces and doing little jokes, but with like hollow cheekbones and a haunted look in his eyes. And it's been interesting watching people try to figure out whether the Stuartian we're the rational ones and so therefore are are poking fun at and pointing out the hypocrisies of both sides of the the battle puts us forever on the high ground to see whether that can still work and hold water in 2024 especially as people were were even starting to find it a little hard to deal with back when Stuart left the show. I'm really curious what you guys have thought of it. I I have felt that the laughs are there and I consistently chuckle each time he does the daily show trick of, you know, 
posing the John Stewartian naive suggestion that this time finally the politicians will see reason and then posting the video clip that demonstrates that they don't see reason. But at any point in this, did it seem to you guys like, oh, this doesn't work anymore in 2024? I mean, I feel like reading the responses to this show, which have been varied, I, I have this feeling that it's somehow it's uncool. It's like allying yourself on the side of the uncool olds to be happy that Jon Stewart is back. And I will say that at least for that opening segment of the show, right, the thing that goes viral the next day, his his monologue, I guess you'd call it, where he's responding to news clips of of the previous day or week. Now it's week, I guess. That that still completely works for me, and I laugh at it, and I'm happy to have him back. And he offers, I agree that what he offers is, you know, it's not rabble rousing. It is a form of comfortable humor, right? But I welcome that comfort back. I don't think that the interview segment of the show with him works as well. I think that the fact that who is going to host the show during the other four days of the week is still in complete suspense and seems like it will remain in suspense through the election season, that those are all mistakes that make The Daily Show look like it's struggling. But when he's sitting there in his host seat doing his thing, I am laughing and I'm appreciating the the insight that he's bringing. So... I don't know. Call me, call me square. I also think he looks really good. <laughs> that whole joke about turn the camera on me so you can see my horrible grizzled visage was sort of like, but you actually look like you've done a lot of good face work. And you, you look perfectly fine to me. I think he looks great, but I, I also think that he's uh, very on his game. And it didn't take long to, you know, sort of for me to warm to his return at all. I've laughed very hard. What I will say is that, Dan, I think you're right. You have to account for what has changed, right? So you 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 take over the show in ninety nine when you know, without drawing a false equivalency, the Clinton presidency had gotten absurd for a variety of reasons. The impeachment, Clinton's own abominable behavior vis a vis Monica Lewinsky and and selling the you know Lincoln bedroom to the highest bidder. So there there was a degree to which both siderism was merited. Secondly, it's a generational thing. In the twenty four years since the cohort or cohorts of people who've come of 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 Daily Show potential Daily Show viewing age are young people who've never known anything but a broken world, a public life. I mean, and they've never known anything but a diminished horizon for themselves individually and effectively a bro- broken social contract. They are fucking angry, and comedy, I think satire, will only make them angrier. I understand that to them, it is a to the barricades moment. Um, and therefore, anything that smacks of, you know, boomer complacency, or both sides do it, I, that one might have some sympathy with younger viewers, but I think there's a sense that laughter maybe isn't quite the appropriate response. I will say that the Stewart incorporated into his opening monologue about Biden and Trump some of those criticisms. I mean, he, he was given a lot of flack for both sides in it when Trump is basically a fascist thug and Biden is just too old. And there's just a you know total categorical difference between the two, worth pointing out. But at, at the same time, he had a rather extended sort of summation at the end of that opening monologue, which he knew everyone was going to be watching. It was probably going to be the most watched since returning. And in which he said, I take that criticism to heart, that politics isn't giving yourself at the end of the day, this little antidote of self-congratulation that I'm not stupid like them. It's actually getting off your sofa and knocking on doors. It's boots on the ground. It's drudgery. It's not fun. And I thought that that was, that went a long way to bringing me back into the fold. Dan, what I will say is that <laughs> there's both sidesing and there's both sidesing. And the the one that brought me up short was when he addressed the situation in Gaza. What do you think? That's a tough episode and and I the biggest laugh I got out of that segment in fact was the gag at the beginning of it. Um he did a whole gag about well, he's they've addressed some tough subjects up till now and people have really been critical of him, but this time They're going to do a light one about Gaza and Israel. Tonight is perhaps an amuse-bouche, a trifle, (laughs) something light. Tonight, we discuss (laughs) Israel-Palestine. Then he mugged and was like, who wrote this? But it is true that wading into that conflict with the kind of 
ethos of the daily show um, in this particular moment is uh, like borderline insane, honestly. And I think I maybe could have taken it. Like, I think I could have just swallowed it if it wasn't for the, like the little branding gimmick that the daily show loves to do where they put up, you know, and on the screen over his right shoulder, a funny logo and like a punny little name. We're going to take a look in our new and probably never ending segment. Yeah, this time it was the feudal crescent. It's new, but tonight <laughs> we discuss Israel Palestine. Any discussion of Israel Palestine is not meant to endorse or justify all the actions of your side. Mentions of the mafia fail to condemn Hamas do not mean we don't condemn Hamas. Do not listen to this segment if you are predisposed to anti Semitism or Islamophobia. Common side effects of discussing in the Middle East are depression, anxiety, infections of the perineum, and craving hummus. And part of me just died when I saw that. Like the notion that this particular conflict can and should be packaged in the cutesy daily show, here we go again mode just made me crazy and then yes he made a i think a pretty game attempt to shake both sides of this conflict by the shoulders and say you're both being nuts if only you just both stopped being nuts this thing could finally end and that is definitely a mode that seems designed to satisfy no one enrage everyone and not actually move the conversation in any useful way. And so I just found it like gruesome to watch. And it highlighted to me the way that the daily show mode becomes comically ineffective when applied to almost any real world tragedy or, or situation more complex than just well, politicians, eh? Yeah, it struck me watching that that feudal crescent segment that as a Jew too, you know, John Stewart is in a in a different position, right? I mean, there aren't that many late night hosts, comedy hosts that have that subject position as a, a Jewish comedian commenting on Israel. And it seemed like a moment to me when he could have Maybe it's early in his in his new tenure to do this, but where he could have gone serious, right? I mean, there are those moments like after 9-11, the famous sort of speech he made after after that event on The Daily Show. Or I I was I, along with almost everyone, I believe, was not a watcher of his show on Apple, The Problem with Jon Stewart on Apple TV Plus. That show I like gathered, everyone on Earth. You didn't right, watch that nobody show. watched it. And I gather nobody watched it because it was too serious. It didn't contain enough humor, right? But he, I think, along with Stephen Colbert, is always kind of walking that line, just like Colbert had to go from playing the Stephen Colbert character to su suddenly being himself, right? Under Trump, he could no longer be that character, and he had to speak out as himself. I think it would be to The Daily Show's advantage and and just a, a, a better use of Jon Stewart's talent and intellect if he was more able to switch between those two modes. Yeah, I, I, I really I agree with you, Dan. I thought it was a grotesque misfire. And maybe to put too fine a point on it, but th the reason The Daily Show worked and worked when it did in that sort of heyday from 99, from the Lewinsky scandal, Bush Gore up through the final aw awful catastrophe of the, the Bush presidency up through 08, was the, the horror of American public life is courtesy in no small part to an aura of unreality in politics that if, if I had to really put a villainous face to it began kind of with Reagan. This idea that you're in a simulacrum, that it's a kind of postmodern, you know, a, a looking glass that we've passed through. And it's so heavily mediated by television uh, that, that the real and the unreal have blended together. And the comic genius of The Daily Show was it, it entered into the discourse of the unreal by being a pretend new show. And then exploded it almost like a comedic virus from within and it what it did is it brought you face to face with the horror of a public mentality that couldn't distinguish between the real and the unreal and that mode for this tragedy is so really grotesquely inappropriate i think because this is not a tragedy that originates in the unreal or the postmodern simulacrum it is ancient and the, the extent of the suffering 
is so vast that to pretend that the appropriate response is to draw it into the formulas of of television and then the satirization of the formula of television just just was wrong from the opening and it it just made me feel like profoundly sad and m- mournful watching it but i will say he won me back with the you know it's not just that he took down katie Britt, who's an easy target it's that he then expanded to a much larger point which was quite a good one which is that the the people who now wrap themselves most tightly in the constitution and the american flag are the most anti-american people alive on the planet i mean they're literally perverting the original impulse behind creating the country by turning to trump as a potential salvific tyrant and he just did it so deftly each turn of it was so funny but also so precise and that really worked because it, it's we're idiots who went through the fucking looking glass together over the last 30, 40 years. This country, this society, it implicates all of us. And in satirizing something like that, he's also holding a mirror up to us, the viewer, you know, that we participated in this society of the spectacle. And and that just doesn't work when you're reaching so far out of the American context to talk about the situation in uh, Palestine. Yeah. He did not win me back with that. And that just felt like the notion that pointing out that the Republicans who wrap themselves in the flag are actually betraying the principles of America has been made so many times and achieves nothing and solves nothing and and has no effect on a party that is incapable of shame, um, that it just becomes another instance of pointing out hypocrisy on the part of people who in fact revel in hypocrisy and for whom it's the the chief plank in their platform. Yeah, but I I don't think that that was an ineffective segment at least for me because I think it's an important reminder that we are the patriots. It's not that that it's the elitists you know the cosmopolites, the you know the bu- hermetically sealed bubble creatures of the you know People's Republic of the Upper West Side versus like quote unquote real America. That paradigm is still strong enough, and there's enough self hatred among the you know coastal city dwellers or whomever to sort of fall for it a little bit to remind us that we are actually the patriots, that we are protecting the principles that this country was founded on, that it's not some tribal, you know, uh, uh, pseudo civil war, you know, between us and them. It's actually the founding principles of the country that these people have profoundly forgotten. And it filled me with, a, I thought, a, a healthy zeal to push back on that. But fair enough. Yeah, I was thinking revisiting Jon Stewart in the in the seat of, of The Daily Show about what it meant that first time around and how important he was. I saw this, too, in some of the, the critics, TV critics writing about, you know, memories of that George W. Bush era Daily Show. And it struck me that that was before social media, right? It was before smartphones, at least the sort of heyday of his show and during the, that, you know, that period of the Bush administration and the reelection of Bush. I think that it served something of the purpose that since then, you know, back when they existed, common social media platforms started to serve, which was a place to sort of just unpack the events of the day and the headlines and say, wait, am I insane? Is this really happening? You know, and to either wisecrack about it to sort of let off some pressure or, you know, to dig deeper in. Um, And that functionality of The Daily Show no longer functions in the same way because there are other places that happens and those conversations are so widespread. And he has been so influential on political comedy and late night TV that those conversations are happening everywhere. So to me, there was a sense of nostalgia and warmth at seeing Jon Stewart again. He is still funny. He's still sharp. He still makes me laugh. But I do think that it's fair to say that the purposefulness of that show has become dispersed over the, you know, 20 years since he made it big. Beautifully put, Dana. Uh, all right. Well, it's The Daily Show. Uh, once a week, you get John Stewart. It's Monday nights. You can get the highlights on YouTube. It's also streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Check it out. Very curious to know what people's relationship to the show was and to the new uh, reboot is. All right. Let's move on. Bill Clinton becomes first president to participate in a live internet chat using his real name. The unprecedented event came off without a hitch, save for a 10 minute time delay while the president's advisors figured out how to turn off the Britney Spears naked file with siren flashes. (laughs) 
Imagine upgrading your wardrobe with luxury essentials at unbeatable prices. Quince is here to transform the way you shop with a range of high-quality items priced within reach, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters for $50, organic cotton sweaters, washable silk tops, and timeless 14-karat gold jewelry. The best part is that all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us. And they only work with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. I wish Steve was in today to talk about Quince because I know he has a few items from them that he loves. I still have just the one shirt, my wine red silk shirt that I wear when I want to be professional and fancy. But Quince has kindly offered me another product and I'm waiting for it to arrive right now. I ordered a silk skirt from them because I like the texture of their silk so much. And it's this wonderful color called gray lilac that's sort of a very muted pale, pale lilac. I can't wait to get that in the mail and make it part of my spring wardrobe. I'll be sure to wear it in a taping sometime so that Steve can admire the fabric. Indulge in affordable luxury. Go to quince.com slash culture for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash culture to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash culture. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. That's 3% on all your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City Branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. All right, before we go any further, this is typically where we discuss business. Dana, what do we have? Our Slate Plus segment this week, Steve, is The Me Show. It's an interview with me, Dana Stevens, about a piece I wrote for Slate.com. Actually, part of why we're talking about it on today's show is Dan Kois is one of our co-hosts. Dan Kois edited this piece and assigned it to me, and it's about Judith Butler and their new book, Who's Afraid of Gender, which I reviewed for Slate. And in a larger sense, just my experience being one of Judith Butler's lucky advisees at UC Berkeley back when I was getting a degree there. So it's sort of a combination of an autobiographical essay and a book review. And we decided, because there's a little bit of a, of a history there, both my personal history and you know the history of Dan and I creating it together, that we would talk about me on Judith Butler. So if you're a Slate Plus member, you can hear us talk about that after the show. And if you're not a Slate Plus member, you can become one by going to slate.com slash culture plus. When you're a member, you get members-only programming, like that segment I just described. You also get ad-free podcasts, so you never again have to hear me read an ad. And not only that, you get unlimited access to all of the writing and all of the podcasting on Slate.com. These memberships are really what keeps Slate afloat. So please, if you haven't already, sign up today at Slate.com slash Culture Plus. All right, back to the show. All right, well, the Salvadoran writer, comic, actor, Julio Torres, his resume as a TV writer included stints on SNL. He was a co-creator and producer on HBO's Los Espookies. His first feature film is out, it's Problemista, and it tells the story of a Salvadoran immigrant in the United States on a rapidly expiring work visa who must find a viable employer, and he's stuck in such a Kafka-esque purgatory and so desperate that he takes a job in a cryogenic freezing business and from there latches on to an art world how to, how to describe her. She's a critic, something of a hanger-on. Anyway, her name is Elizabeth, and she's played by Tilda Swinton. It turns out to be a nightmare boss whose mood swings and whims he must try to navigate. In the clip, we're going to hear Tilda Swinton's Elizabeth and Torres as Alejandro. They're at lunch. She asks him to help her recover her late husband's artwork. Even as they discuss it, she berates a waiter. Let's listen. Having a young man of your intelligence who now has an insight into Bobby's working methods. Uh, I truly believe that together we could curate a show. Oh, yes. Right. I mean, curators have no imagination. I mean, none of them see what I see. Yeah. But if we do the, their homework for them. We, we, could, we could pitch it around even. We could pitch it around. Exactly. Was there something it, wrong with your salad, Alejandro? Oh, no. No, no, it's fine. It's just I can't help noticing that they neglected to hold the cheese as we specifically asked them to. And uh, this young gentleman cannot eat it, cheese. It's, it's, it's fine. You tell him. I, I'm, I'm vegan. He's allergic. To goat cheese or... Everything. Oh, we'll refund the salad. Well, that's not what we want. Uh, okay, I, I just don't know what else I could do. I, I can't go back Fetch in somebody time. somebody else who would I'm say something sorry. different. 
Okay, Dana, what did you make of uh, Problemista? You know, I'm really curious to talk about this movie with you guys because it's it's a lot. There is so much going on in this movie. I would say that it took probably 30 minutes to win me over, but in the end, it really did win me over. I have some feedback to Julio Torres as a director. I think this movie is a little bit what I would call over-directed. Like it's jam-packed with dream sequences and magical realist flashbacks and, you know, like nutty moments where everybody suddenly appears in wild costume in a completely different setting to sort of project what's happening inside the the perception of the Julio Torres character. And all of that gets a little busy. Tilda Swinton's performance is also very busy. But Ultimately, I think this movie has really good jokes, uh, a, a really interesting duo at its heart, and it's taking on some really, really big questions about immigration and about art and about mortality, and I ended up really respecting it. I don't think that I love everything about it, but it's it's weird and charming and completely its own thing. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a pro. I would just like to shout out the incredible generosity of Tilda Swinton to dress up like a clown and lend this very charming but somewhat slight movie some real muscle. Like the character of Elizabeth, who is a caricature of an art world person who over the course of the movie turns into an actual character who, surprisingly, I came to care about quite a bit, is just a totally remarkable comic creation. And in a way that I think speaks well of Julio Torres's artistic instincts – takes over the movie in the same way that she takes over Alejandro's life. Tilda Swinton wears this hilarious pink wig, just a rat's nest of a shitty pink wig. She wears absurd clothes. She spends the movie just forever incensed at some poor customer service person (laughs) yelling human at her phone over and over again, the way we all do human, 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 human. Um, Her phone light is always on in every scene where you see her phone. The flashlight is on. (laughs) It's consistent through the whole movie. It's an incredible running gag that never gets addressed. And she just overwhelms the movie. You described her performance, Dana, as a lot. I felt like it was exactly what this movie needed because Torres has set her up as the foil to his character, who Alejandro, who tiptoes daintily around New York, always with his backpack on. It's like he's walking so quietly that he wants to make sure no one can even hear his steps. He speaks so quietly that no one can hear what he says. He has this incredible verbal tick whenever someone says something terrible to him, like making it clear they're about to fire him. He says, oh, no. Mm -hmm. And the gag of the movie, the central gag of the movie is that he needs to learn something from the monster who is employing him from Tilda Swinton's character. And she is incapable of ever learning anything from him. And I loved that duo that comic duo uh it was like a comic energy pairing that i'd never really seen before um and i love that she was willing to come into this movie and just give it 175 fucking percent uh at every single moment it was like what a gift to a young director making his first movie oh i i like the movie that you described dan i, I wish it was the movie that i watched i mean so a number of things i mean it it, it he is very boyish this character boyish to a fault some critics have even said there's something arrested about him um his haircut is kind of the equivalent of the i agree very funny gag of the flashlight always being on tilda swinton's phone he always has this one little sh- one little bit of hair that's sticking up in <laughs> like the back, dennis which the is, menace yeah which is funny because the amount of hairdressing it must take to make that consistent shot to shot is magnificent and it conveys his total lack of stylishness or self-consciousness this is a story about it's it's intrinsically heroic we're rooting for him to the extent that especially at this moment he is uh, attempting to stay in the united states as a salvadoran immigrant it's heroic in that torres is himself has a life story that that parallels that one nonetheless i found it very hard to root for someone who wants to live in new york city he lacks any street smarts or pluck ostensibly or really humor or self-awareness or definiteness of any kind 
I, I don't like the hurly burly mythos, the self regarding arrogant mythos of New York City very much myself. But nonetheless, it is a city that exists to chew up and spit people out. Unfortunately, that is sort of where some of its energy comes from. I wasn't really rooting for this guy to hang on in New York City, nor to realize his dream of being a toy designer. There's a point beyond which like guilelessness becomes a sort of awful gullibility. But to me, funnily enough, the real issue is the is the movie's massive imbalance between his status as a kind of cipher and um this overfull creation of the Swinton character, Elizabeth, who I find in theory, Dan, exactly right. Like, I mean, she's an extraordinary actress. She's done up beautifully. And the idea that the energy of the film would come from someone who's inherently monstrous and these two people are going to find the yin in each other's yang and that would somehow make them better creatures. But she's totally unfun to be around. It's like being around someone who's suffering from a you know, and in fact, I think the movie strongly suggests she's suffering from a personality disorder. It's exhausting. It's not that funny. It's really about the only third of the movie or even like quarter of the movie where there are one or two nearly transcendent touches where she softens and you see the br- the brokenness and she's an actress that can do that so beautifully. For me, it was a little too late. I, I just really genuinely didn't like this film. Yeah, Steve, af- right after Dan gave his his praise of, of Tilda Swinton as the, you know, the force that makes this movie work, I was going to say, don't you think that her forcefulness sort of washes out the main character? And that's not really the actor's fault. It's not because of what Tilda Swinton is doing. It's because of what Torres, I think, more as a director than as an actor is doing, uh, you know, which is which is, as you say, creating his character as somebody who is almost from a sort of cartoon universe. You know, he yeah, seems like somebody exactly. from a graphic novel in his complete naivete and childlikeness. I had to look up how old Julio Torres was because he has such a baby face. He's 37. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with him p- playing a character who's younger than him and, and more naive. And he's playing him as an eight-year-old boy. I mean, that's the problem. He is playing him as an eight-year-old boy. He doesn't say or do anything in the course of the film that makes him seem different from, and I'm not even really exaggerating, like a preteen boy. And I just, that's a very strong choice, but it it it's, exa- it's like he, exasperating. He's exasperating. She's exhausting. This is, I think, goes to why I said I didn't start to like this movie until about 30 minutes, 35 minutes maybe in. And maybe that's when, as you said, the the really hard to take nature of Swinton's character starts to have more give and take with the world around her and, and with his character. And yeah, again, I think that this movie's pacing is flawed and there's a lot about it that that sort of jangles. But but in that bag of jangly bits are are so many gem-like things. I'm just surprised, Steve, that you didn't find more to appreciate. But I can see how somebody would turn off this movie after half an hour of Elizabeth, who is a very, very hard-to-take character. All right, Dan, I don't know why this movie crawled so far under my skin. I think probably you're closer to the truth of it than, than I am in some sense. But it did bother me. One thing I did admire about it is, it, for the first time in a very long time, I felt as though I w- were watching an independent movie back in like 1992 or 1994 before Sundance became overly cutesy and self-aware when movies on, I don't know what the budget of this one was, it certainly felt like a slimly budgeted movie, were allowed the freedom of their own whimsy and the whimsy of their creator. It really felt to me like a movie from 20, 25, 30 years ago in the kind of very early heyday of Sundance Nation. And in that sense, the great inflation would allow one to say this is a person with the courage of their own weirdness and vision. I think that's definitely true. I mean, it reminded me of a filmmaker from a little more recently than that, which who is Michelle Gondry. It reminded me a lot of a very early Michelle Gondry film in its whimsy, but also in its desire to find unusual, fantastical filmic ways to uh, illustrate the internal lives of its characters. And Dane is right that at times that becomes a little bit busy, like the number of times we return to the cavern or return to Alejandro in his sort of fanciful, uh, like uh, Lego block stepped world that represents the Kafka-esque labyrinthine bureaucracy of the U.S. immigration system. Like that after a while, you're like, okay, I get it. But yet he kept finding interesting, new, surprising ways to illustrate his character's interior life. 
and in its total willingness to buy into um, what uh, on its face and certainly from Steve's reaction is kind of a bad idea to create this one character who so totally overwhelms the ostensible protagonist of this movie and to make that protagonist so regressive uh, and almost infantile, as you say, um, it seemed, it did seem very devoted to its own particular vision. And I did like that about this movie. I like a movie that is willing to, make as its central problem in many ways something as totally ridiculous and useless as the difficulty of FileMaker Pro as a, <laughs> as that a database a great joke. application. Yeah. A, real, um, a running joke like that it. completely earns its stripes. Like every time you yes. hear the words FileMaker Pro, it gets funnier. And the Julio Torres's willingness to make that one of the battles, the stupid battles that his character must fight throughout this movie and to devote so much of the movie to this unbelievably particular issue, I found that really heartening. And yes, I'm sure certainly led to a little great inflation on my part that when I see an artist making something that so clearly just comes out of his own particular interests and annoyances – Sometimes those annoyances are small and sometimes those annoyances are existential as they are for any immigrant coming into the United States faced with a situation like this. That really warms my heart and makes me want the thing to succeed and makes me want to see the next thing that this person is going to do. Damn you, Dan Coyce, you convinced me. <laughs> Damn you. Before we close, can I shout out one of the small magical realist sidebars? So. I did sometimes get exhausted by the, you know, the visual whimsy and always cutting to different worlds, but I never, ever got tired of Larry Owens, the great Broadway star, returning again and again as the personification of Craigslist <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the mind of, of Julio Torres. It was just this wonderful conceit where every time his character goes to Craigslist to get another humiliating job to try to extend his visa, we see this demonic, sensuous creature played by Larry Owens, who's sort of the essence of Craig, Craigslist drawing him in once more. And those were such funny bits that it just pushing him ever toward the more and more perverted jobs that he could eventually <laughs> take mm. yeah all right i'm probably wrong all right the movie's problemista it's uh, as of now only in theaters i'm sure it'll be streaming at some point soon if you haven't seen it check it out let us know what you think This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. Tell me about your mama's kitchen. That simple request opens up a flood of delicious memories, and it's at the center of the Audible original podcast, Your Mama's Kitchen. On Your Mama's Kitchen, host Michelle Norris talks to guests like Michelle Obama, Glennon Doyle, Leslie Jones, Matthew McConaughey, and more about how their earliest culinary experiences helped shape their personal and professional lives. And of course, each guest brings a recipe for a favorite dish from their youth, so you can taste a bit of their story. It's a show about cuisine and culture. 
ingredients and identities, and the meals and memories that make us who we are. Find your mama's kitchen anywhere you listen. Well, the ever delightful Dan Pashman has devoted his podcast, The Sporkful and its many derivatives, to eaters, not foodies. All delight, no self seriousness, is the utterly winning Pashman formula, and he brought it to bear in creating a new pasta shape. Cascatelli went, as he says, viral. He's now creating a cookbook that's a kind of companion to Cascatelli. It's sort of about the sauces to go with the noodles, but with a twist, anything possible features mashups of the blank canvas of the very Italian noodle with the very non-Italian palates of India, Thailand, Middle East, North Africa, South America, various points in Asia. Dan, welcome back to the show. You are very close an old friend and a granola Benedict Arnold, but uh, <laughs> I've chosen I've chosen to let that slide. Ballot box stuffer. Yeah. <laughs> Freaking low life. <laughs> I decided to let you back on the I, show. I'm glad you've let that one go, Steve. <laughs> Letting I've totally let it go. Uh I love that your qualifications for doing this is that you have no qualifications for doing it. I mean the thinness of your resume <laughs> the, uh, that you <laughs> that you brought to creating a new pasta shape, that was the charm, right? Like it was kind of the naive palette. Only the naive palate uh, and someone who didn't know what they didn't know, that you know what you don't know, could make Cascatelli, which is delicious. I've had it many times. My heart leaps up when I see it in stores. It's a really cool triumph for you. And now you've created this uh, cookbook. W- explain how one led to the other. Yeah, so 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 Cascatelli came out in 2021. It's It was a success beyond my wildest dreams. You know, it's this shape, especially it's Italian for waterfalls, especially designed to hold a ton of sauce and have all these interesting textures. And it was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year, which was bananas. It was everywhere from like the New York Times to Access Hollywood, which was not something that was on my vision board when I started off. And everyone sent me pictures of what they're making with it. And it was exciting that everyone was cooking it. But then I started to see like over and over and over again, it was just the same. It was like cascatelli with tomato sauce, meat sauce, mac and cheese. I mean, maybe a few party animals made pesto. And it was just kind of sad to me. Like there's, you know, and it just made me realize that I think most Americans have a very limited range of pasta dishes that they cook regularly. And even I myself, without realizing it, was kind of in a, a tomato sauce rut. And I, so then I, you know, I kind of always had in the back of my head, my dream to like write a, a good book. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe this could be a cookbook. What if I do? What if, what if I put together a collection of recipes to show people there's so much more they can and should be putting on pasta? You talk about this a bit on an episode of The Sporkful, the, the first one of the series about creating this book, Dan. But I want you to talk about it a little bit for our listeners, which is when a non- recipe writer, right? A non-chef goes in to write a cookbook, right? You need to get editorial help. You need to f- sort of figure out a style sheet. You need to figure out what it is to write a recipe that's that's cookable and readable, and but also has a voice of its own. Can you talk about the journey that you, you made from guy who makes food at home to somebody who created a cookbook? Yeah, for sure. And, and I, when I started writing this cookbook, the first question I got from a lot of friends was, how do you actually come up with the recipes? Even people who buy a lot of cookbooks, I think, don't know how they're made. So we did this special series on the Sporkful, telling kind of the inside story. And I tried to kind of, you know, pull the curtain back in the the book. And like you say, Dana, I'm not a chef. So I knew right off the bat, I'm like, I need some help if I'm going to have good recipes in this thing. Because I don't know how to, I haven't developed recipes myself. So I knew I had it in my head I was going to hire recipe developers. I didn't really understand what that was going to all entail, though. So I basically sort of went out started talking to friends in the world of food media who do do recipe developing. And recipe development, in case you're not familiar with that term, it's basically just like a, it's a job. You basically just test, and, you know, anytime you're get, seeing a recipe in any sort of high-end recipe, you know, Bon Appetit, New York Times, Food and Wine, any of those, those are being done by professional recipe testers as opposed to just sort of like, I mean, bloggers at home who are putting up recipes. Um, and they, that means the recipe has been tested many times and it's really been professionally vetted. And I wanted to do that because I know I'm not capable of doing that myself. So I assembled this like all-star squad of recipe testers and it's, it was sort of like putting together a team of superheroes or like super villains. You know how like they always, eat, you know, in the movies, Dana, they always each have their, a specialty. There's like the code breaker and then there's like the weapons person and then there's like the acrobat who can like leap through windows. And so like that was kind of my approach in trying to find different folks to collaborate with who had different culinary specialties. And it seems like they're not only sort of helping you test them, but, you know, they have credits on individual recipes and it seems like they're helping you work out how these recipes will work best, helping you sort of put your ideas into action and, and sort of walking you through the process. I 
last night we made the well, recipe from the book. We made the swordfish with salsa verde. We I used cascatelli instead of the pasta in the recipe because what the hell is that pasta? <laughs> Sanya a Pepsi. Yeah, the, uh, the I mean, like I only know one company that makes it, but it's so good. I call it Oops All Ruffles. It's like yeah. Captain Crunch berries, uh, Oops All berries, but it's all ruffles. It's all the ruffles from the edges of lasagna. It sounds yeah. delicious, but I was not going to mail order. It. <laughs> that's fine. That's but, fine. You know, I was very intrigued by going through that recipe. There's a real, you know, depth of ingredients to it, and. There's a real process to it. You know, you you give people the option of using a food processor to make the salsa verde, but you really recommend using a mortar and pestle. And then you have this person's name on it, this credit, Asha Lupi. And it's very interesting to me to see you sort of transforming from a guy who, as Steve reminds you, has no qualifications and doesn't know anything, <laughs> to a person who now you know is collaborating with these recipe testers and is putting his name on a cookbook, and you know is going out and doing events where you're cooking in front of people. And so, do you feel like you are gaining expertise, or do you still feel like a guy who's faking it all along? And it just so happens that you can make good food and publish a cookbook, but if anyone challenged you. Like Steve, for example, you built like a flower. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say some of both. I decided to credit every recipe developer on the recipes that they developed, like on the page, not just in the back, which is normally where it happens when you when recipe develop. And I didn't realize that that was kind of exceptional when I chose to do it, but I, I'm glad that I did because, at least in my process, the recipe developers really like collaborators. It's not like I was just saying, "I want this dish, you go figure it out." It was a back and forth, and a lot of the ideas for the recipes were things we came up with together. That recipe you're talking about, Dan, I mean, so Asha Lupi is, you know, she is on Instagram at from head to table. She's got a great newsletter. She's so talented. And she and I just have very similar taste. And and I was saying, like, I love swordfish. Let's have a swordfish dish in here. And she was saying, what about salsa verde? I said, great. And so, she, you know, she would come up with something. We'd go back and forth on it. In terms of my transformation, like, I did a, I did my first ever cooking demo last night at a restaurant in Atlanta, and it was very intimidating to me. And I, I think I did well enough. Um, it was a pretty simple dish. It was the roasted artichokes and preserved lemon with cavatelli from the cookbook. I definitely, after testing every single recipe in this book and working with these recipe developers for a year, I'm definitely a better home cook than I used to be. I think I'm more knowledgeable. I do feel more comfortable. I still feel intimidated by the idea of cooking in front of people, and I still... You know, like I, I went to do this Instagram thing with a, with a guy who's much more experienced in the kitchen than I am. And I got very self-conscious. He's like, okay, now chop the garlic for the camera. And I'm like, which way do you chop garlic again? Is this oh, the right yeah, way? You know, terrifying yeah. <laughs> to me, someone be someone like judging my chop. Yeah, no, it was right. And it turns out I knew how to do it correctly, but I just sort of was questioning myself in that moment. So, you know, but in the end, as much as I still do have some hangups about I, you know, I'm, I, I probably will never feel like a chef. For the cookbook, I came to see my lack of professional training as a strength because this book is for home cooks. It's not for chefs. I want home cooks to get it. And I want the, the most important thing you want when you make a cookbook, as I've learned, is you want people to have success cooking the recipes. And so I went in thinking that the hardest part of the recipes was going to be the measurements. Like, how, how, like, should it be one teaspoon of this or two teaspoons? But that it turned out to be not that hard. I didn't agonize over that. The part that I agonized over was the writing of the instructions and and how to write the instructions to be as clear as possible. Because a, re a recipe developer would write the recipe, it would come to me, and sometimes I'd be confused. So I'd say, if I'm confused, probably other home cooks would be confused. So how can we make it clear? But without suddenly turning this into a 10-page recipe. And just as you all are writers, you know, it's the same. It's, it's, it really becomes more of an exercise in writing, but a very specific type of writing of how do we, how are we going to lay out these instructions in a way that will be clear to all different people in all different kitchens with all different equipment so that they can have good results. And that was the part that I really stressed over the most. I just want to do justice to the Sporkful podcast that accompanied the creation of this cookbook. They're a procedural, behind the scenes procedural. They're also a, a family sitcom. It's <laughs> utter, utterly hilarious uh, and totally captivating. I, I want more of the, of the Pashman crew in my life. Very honest feedback. A very, <laughs> like, just, like, brutal. Sometimes a little leveling. brutal. Yeah, sometimes too honest, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, the, the tween knows how to rip your yeah. heart out to see what it <laughs> looks like in uh, open air. But changing directions slightly, you know, it, it, in both the creation of Cascatelli and the cookbook, the Italianness, the utter Italianness of Italian cooking 
is in a way your partner and foil, right? You're trying to both honor it and yet its essence is centuries of tradition of making the same thing, making a typically very simple thing beautifully with exquisite care. And you're sort of blowing away the centuries of love like cobwebs in a sense, while also then trying to renew and revive them. I mean, what kind of feedback do you get when you take a sort of fla- set of flavor colorings from a very non-Italian culture and add them to pasta. I mean, some people, I probably, most people treat it as a kind of revelation. Do you get interesting pushback? Do you get people saying this is heresy? What's what's the range? So I did a research trip across Italy for this book, and that was the subject of one of the episodes of the podcast. And I mean, yes, certainly there's pushback. Uh, from some, you know, like I like so I have this dish in there called spaghetti a la Sassina. Assassin spaghetti is this pan fried spaghetti that gets crispy and crunchy. And I added grated Parmesan on top. And I messaged a friend of mine in Bari, the city where this pasta comes from. And he was like, okay, fine, just don't tell anyone from Bari. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, other people were like, okay, like if you want to borrow from this dish and, tra- and turn it into a pasta dish, that's fine, but don't name it after the original dish because it's not that. Okay, that's fair. In terms of things like kimchi carbonara, which is in the book, or cacio e pepe with chili crisp. You know, I think that they're just sort of, well, it depends on the person. So the big revelation for me, traveling across Italy, and I I, I spent time with this woman named Katie Parla, an American who's been living in Italy and writing about Italian food for 20 plus years. I interviewed a food historian in Bologna named Luca Cesari, who's written a whole book about the story of pasta. And what, what they explained to me that was a huge revelation to me is that pasta only became the national food of Italy about 100 years ago. When the fascists came to power, they needed to unite the Italian, the, the disparate, these disparate groups under one nationalist identity, and they thought pasta was the way. And there's all this fascist propaganda from the early 20th century of pasta being the true Italian food. And the fascists built pasta factories in parts of Italy where there had been none before, where pasta was not a big part of the food culture at all. And that's what spread pasta. And then you know, dishes like carbonara, carbonara was only invented in the 1940s or 50s. I mean, I would have guessed the Roman emperors were eating it. It was only invented pretty recently and only with help from Americans being there during World War II and bringing rations like bacon and eggs and bacon and eggs ending up in Italian kitchens and that being coming carbonara, which is the raw beaten eggs, the guanciale, which is the cured pork jowl and pepper and cheese. But even for decades after that, the recipe for carbonara varied wildly. There was some versions with chopped clams, garlic and tomatoes, cream, all kinds of things that would, you know, turn any Italian known it today apoplectic. And so there's just a, a lot of mythology around Italian food. Like it's not as old and not as static as we've been led to believe. And I started off on my mission of, of this book kind of thinking that I was kind of kicking down the door of Italian food, but sort of realizing that I'm really not. I, that this book is actually more of one person's contribution to this ongoing and never-ending evolution. No, 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 no. Dan, it's Dan. It's an anti-fascist manifesto. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I'll You've take gone it. to All the right. barricades. Yeah. <laughs> but I like the way you put that. That was well put, as always, Steve. The Italian food culture being kind of what you say, uh, my my partner and foil. And that is that is a good way to think of it. You know, like it's like I love it, but I also want to kind of tweak it. I can't wait to see the nanas with pitchforks coming after you, buddy. <laughs> Dan, unlike Dan Coyce, I have not yet made anything from the book, but I have my eye on something. And I have to say that this book taught me a new word for a thing that I've already been making for years without knowing that it was in a category of Italian food, which is the okay. pan, pan grattato. Can you explain yes. in general what a pan grattato is? So I'm a huge texture eater. I love crisp and crunch in all its forms. And in Italy, they add crisp and crunch to pasta. And of course, it, across the array of Asian noodle and rice dishes, they understand, you know, there's huge emphasis on bringing together different textures. But most of the pasta dishes we eat in America are kind of monotextural. And I, so I have a whole chapter in the book called Carby and Crispy. That's different textures. And a big part of it is, is pan grattata, which are seasoned toasted breadcrumbs. Now, in Italy, they would just typically do it with like garlic, rosemary, or oregano, just like a, a little bit of seasoning, and you sprinkle it over the pasta, and it adds this incredible texture and flavor. I wanted to, you know, take it to another level. So we did a pan, like a furikake pan grattato over a, a, a mushroom dish that has a lot of Asian flavors. There's a one that's smashed corn nuts and lime zest. That I mean, I just keep eating it with a spoon. I can't even. I don't. It doesn't even. I'll make it to the table to sprinkle over the pasta. But it totally. I mean, you know, Dana, you're you're already doing it. 
right? Like it takes five or 10 minutes to make one of these things. You can throw it in your freezer for months and it will absolutely transform whatever you're eating. Yeah, that's something I've done with leftover when you have ends of a good crusty loaf of bread, right? And it's it's either a little bit stale or it's not quite enough to really do anything with. You just like toast it with some thyme and olive oil and turn it into breadcrumbs and throw it on whatever, pasta, soup, et cetera. But to know that it has a name really elevates it. And the one that you mentioned, the lime and corn nut pan grittato, that's the one I've got my eye on. I oh, love so good. that you're turning the bar nut no one can get out of their molars <laughs> into yeah. a fine dining experience. <laughs> so I'll let you know how that turns out when I do the lime and, and corn nut. I can't wait to hear. All right, Dan. Yeah, I can't wait to see how you're going to fake faking it next time. With the, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we were on to you. Let's please, please have you back on soon. We need to find excuses to make this more regular. But in the meantime, the book is Anything's Possible by Dan Pashman. And the podcast, of course, is the just totally infectious, the sporkful. Dan, thanks for coming back on. Really, really fun. Thanks, everyone. Always a pleasure. Spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredation... This episode is brought to you by the new Wondery podcast, Even the Royals. Being part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. They cover icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and ultimately, it cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. All right, now is the moment in our podcast when we endorse. Uh, Dana, what do you have? Okay, out of left field here, I am going to endorse something related to sports. Although I guess arguably this is somewhere in between art and sports. It's a figure skating clip that went really viral this week. Maybe you guys have seen it or, or heard about it already. It was the American teenager Ilya Malinin winning the world figure skating title. I guess it would be the solo. I'm not sure of the official title that he was winning. The level of athleticism that we've already seen in this competition has been brought on by Ilya Malinin and his technical wizardry. But it's this unbelievable 10 minutes of beautiful, beautiful solo skating. And the reason it connects to our show, Steve, is that the music that Ilya Malinin is skating to is the succession theme by our own beloved Nicholas Bratel, who composed our show theme. It ends up working so, so well. Of course, there's millions of different variations of the succession theme, right? The slow, the fast, the suspenseful. And he skates through them all. It's utterly, the execution is unbelievable. If you know anything about skating, he sets a world record by landing six quad jumps. In other words, he does four turns in the air six different times in various combinations. He's setting it up. Yes! Yes! That was a huge one! The artistry and the interpretation, like the fact that this is a teenager is truly, truly unbelievable. Um, It is mind-bogglingly good. So we'll put a link to that on our show page. Ilya Malinin, go, go, go. I hope he goes to the Olympics because I want to see him skate some more. Last jumping pads of the program. Triple lights, triple axel. So difficult. Someone wants to be a world champion. Another beautiful d- detail was that when interviewed about the, the music he had chosen, Ilya Malin and said he's never watched Succession because <laughs> he was too busy learning this incredible skating routine. But apparently he is now interested in, in starting the show. So, um, yeah, Ilya Malin and I hope I hope you enjoy the show. That's awesome. All right, Dan, what do you have? I spent last weekend in Knoxville, Tennessee at the Big Ears Music Festival. Steve, do you know this festival? I don't. I'm not a big music festival guy. You know, I did my time at 
Lollapalooza and the Lilith Fair when I was a young man. But I, in general, I do not like standing in a field all day waiting for the next band to break down the previous band's drums and put up their own drums and then play. But Big Ears is incredible. It is a totally different kind of music festival, and I love it. I've gone – this is my third year at this festival. So they – take over Knoxville for a four day weekend and about 10 different venues across downtown from, you know, tiny little pubs to beautiful 2000 seat art deco, uh, theaters are just filled with music all day long from noon till midnight. And it's every kind of music you can think of jazz, avant-garde noise, bluegrass, cumbia. It's just really insanely great. So like over the three days I was there, I saw Brad Meldow play piano with Christian McBride on bass. And then oh, I saw four yes. percussionists <laughs> play Steve Reich's music for blocks of wood. And then I saw a Dartmouth professor somehow playing a sheet of plexiglass and creating an insane brain melting noise with it. And then I saw Andre 3000 play the flute. And that was just like the tip of the iceberg of all the insane shit that I saw. Seriously. Everyone who is listening, if you love adventurous music, if you love finding new music you've never heard before and being completely blown away by it, if you can get to Knoxville for the Big Ears Festival, do it. It is the great cultural experience of my year. Every year, it just fills me with joy at the breadth of human creativity. It's unbelievable. You had me at Brad Meldow, but that just sounds amazing, and I will try to go next year. Okay, here's one for the panel. Do you know the song, The First Cut is the Deepest? I would have given you all of my heart. But of course. Do you know who wrote The First Cut is the Deepest? Oh, I love the sound of your silence. (laughs) I don't even know who sings The First Cut is the Deepest. I mean, Rod Stewart made it famous, God knows, 40, 50 years ago. Sheryl Crow, I think, covered it to some acclaim. It's an old Cat Stevens song. very early Cat Stevens song when he was writing Hmm. way more traditional, I suppose, music before he fully discovered himself as a singer-songwriter. I went down a Cat Stevens rabbit hole. I mean, you know, these were records my older sister had back in the T for the Tillerman and the Buddha and the whatever, I can't remember, but back I can picture them so vividly back in the, we're talking you know, very early 1970s when they first came out. And, you know, I suppose I've revisited him now and again. Of course, he quit the music business and became a Sufi Muslim, took a lot of flack after 9-11. He's been through the ringer. Um, and there, here's how I found the rabbit hole. I was watching a Tiny Desk concert. I can't remember which one on YouTube. And among the suggested ones in the column on the right-hand side was was him now. And I started watching it. It was profoundly moving because Bob Boylan, who I know only by name as the music editor of NPR and, and the guy behind All Songs Considered, gets in front of the camera to say what Cat Stevens' music meant to him as a kid growing up and especially the song Father and Son. And that was profoundly moving. And then he starts to look at Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam starts to play and he's in beautiful voice. There's something at peace and very tough and very tender about him at the same time. And um, I can't remember whether he does first cut as the deepest on that. Actually, I don't know that he does. He does father and son and the song, a newer song Babylon about Babylon. I can't remember if Babylon is in the title title. We'll link to it. And I just at the whole, I mean, I'm sort of endorsing the first cut as the deepest. His original version is marvelous and people won't, they'll know the song, but won't know his version, which is definitive if you ask me. But just also then watch this Tiny Desk concert and see what someone who's come out the other end of life's punishments in some ways, uh, uh, just a, you know, a deeper, wiser and more at peace human being. It's really moving. I wonder if between your endorsement and them using the wind and the holdovers if we'll see it yeah Cat i think there was a minor one didn't wes anderson use some cat stevens strategically you know 
I feel like he's been a soundtrack mainstay for a while. While to the point yeah. where I almost felt like the holdovers could have used a fresher Cat Stevens song than the one it did, yeah. which is I love the holdovers. Yeah. Should he use the first cut as the deepest? There you go. Dan, thanks for coming on the show and being our Julia this week. It was really, really fun. My pleasure. Dana, as always, a total pleasure. Twas, twas a joy. You will find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page. That's at slate.com slash culturefest. And you can email us at culturefest at slate.com. Our introductory music is by, of course, Nicholas Patel, author of the Succession theme song. Our production assistant is Kat Hong. Our producer is Jared Downing for Dana Stevens, Dan Coyce, and uh, Dan Pashman. I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer and set of offers. 15,178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xE and Summit 4xE models and dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark. We will see you soon.